Hey there, welcome to ATL and 29, a podcast where we look at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. My name is Kevin Chenard. I'm here with Glenn Willis. We're recording on a Saturday night before the big Celtics uh, Hawks game in Boston on Sunday. Glenn, what what do the Hawks have to do to stop Peyton Pritchard? Uh, I, I guess that's why DeAndre Hunter is going to play. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, there you go. Problem there solved. All right. Well, that was a great episode. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So I'm not terribly interested in uh, Friday's loss. I'm not terribly interested in Sunday's game against Boston because uh, those games really didn't mean much. So let's okay. talk heat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the Friday game was a bad loss. I understand the frustration, but I don't see any value in rehashing any of it. it yeah. Um, yeah, the heat. I mean, that's, I've already, you know, spent like an hour tonight digging in a little bit, putting a little bit of content out on Twitter. So I, everyone can see, I'm already focusing on that, on that game Tuesday night. So let's dig in. All right. So, uh, you know, given that there's has to be sort of a sense of urgency, what, what changes for the Hawks, given that, it isn't just as you know. A se- it is just isn't the right word, but it isn't a seven game series like their last post regular season experience against the Heat. It's just going to be one game. So you know what has to happen in the first five minutes to sort of set things right. Yeah, it's kind of funny you word the question that way because I put out a like a, a pretty good bit of content tonight on Twitter, and after I was done, I shared that all of that analysis came from the first six minutes of the game, the last game these two teams played against each other. So all of the plays, all of the analysis, everything was from the first six minutes. So I think the first six minutes are, you know, critical. I think, you know, I think the Heat have, um, the Heat are more confident in the things that they need to do to win this game, in my view, right? They want to be physical. They want to hit you with first, second, third, fourth actions, keep going. Um, you know, they want to show bodies uh, to your primary uh, creators. And those are, you know, that's muscle memory for them, you know? So, um, so for me, like it starts with physicality. If the Hawks allow the heat to come out and impact them with their physicality and the Hawks don't make any effort to kind of match that physicality, then I think it's, they're on a they're starting on a bad path early in the game. So that that is to me like the number the first kind of binary factor in this game is maybe it starts with the first level is can the Hawks deal with the Heat's level of physicality? Ideally, the next level is you to some degree match the Heat's physicality. Um, because if they don't do that, then the you know the Heat are going to dictate what the Hawks do all night long, what they don't do all night long. And it has to, to kind of come down to that. And it's it's problematic, not impossible, but the problematic because it's in the it's in the heat's nature to be physical. I, I don't I think it's fair to say that's not the Hawks like tendency is to want to play a physical game, but they have to in this game. They absolutely have to. And that's that's the thing I'm I'm watching for from the very beginning, first of all, is just can the Hawks you know, again, first level is can they deal with it? Second level is can they match it to some degree? And that's that's probably the biggest factor in my mind. What changes for the Hawks in a matchup with Miami if you have Quinn Snyder instead of Nate McMillan? What what tendencies change that may be better or may be worse, whatever? Well, so when I went back and did some rewatching, I focused on the last game they played, which was, which was I thought the most representative of what the Hawks needed to do. The Heat won that game by two, this I think one thirty two to one thirty game. But you could see the Hawks were right out of the gate trying to attack the Heat's defense before they could get set. Right, Clint would be around the top of the key, kind of lurking, ready to give Trey a ball screen if needed, and that would draw Bam up above the free throw line in most cases, and Bam was ready to be part of that wall that they create against middle pick and roll. And when they would load up high early, he would attack that seam and get to the rim or attack that seam and create, you know, a good shot for someone else. And they did that even after makes. So that's something that really under Nate, they never did. I should say like by, 
game four last year, you saw like in the first quarter of Trey trying to run that corner seam action with Bogey in the corner or whoever in the corner and make that work. But it was, it was kind of like, we're going to give it two or three shots. And if it doesn't work, Trey was just gassed and, and all that. So, but in that game, like they attacked early in the shot clock before they could get set. That's the biggest difference. The The second thing is that early in that Miami game, when the Hawks would get to a secondary action, they would attack it like right away. But that's not in the Hawks' nature either. The Hawks' tendency has been for the last two or three years that the opposing defense defends their first action. They basically pull it back out, reset, and run something pretty simple, an ISO or a basic, you know, trying to force a switch or and get a mismatch. And and I shared one of the things I shared on Twitter was that when you watch when I rewatch these teams, these two teams play from this year, the major thing that jumps out at you is that when Miami's opponent shuts down their first action, they go right to the second action, right to the third action, right to the fourth action, boom, 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 boom. You cover that screen lifting a shooter from the corner, flip it, flare screen back in the opposite direction, bam, right? On the weak side. Back screen for the lob, you cover that lob, they flip it and lift that shooter up to the top of the key, especially with Kevin Love now on the team that, you know, they have that second, third, fourth kind of wrinkle. Hawks, by and large, when the opponent shuts down their first action, they're kind of done. The hard work is done. The heavy lifting is done. And in this game, that absolutely can't happen. So, I'm you know, I'm interested, like, DJ would run a side or, or slash pick and roll, and um, and the Heat would switch it and cover it. But then the Hawks would kind of work the ball through the lane, create a bunch of space, and then someone from the weak side would attack that space right down the middle and get to the rim. Hunter did it. You never call Hunter getting to the rim in that first quarter of that last game. JC a couple times too. So for me, it's attack before attack before the Heat get their defense set. Number two, be urgent with your second and third offensive actions, which is not in the Hawk tendency. So again, Big three. Number one, be physical. Not the Hawks go to. Number two, attack early in the shot clock. They can do it, but they have to stay disciplined to doing it. Number three, if the Heat stop your first action, be intentional and act with urgency getting your second, third, fourth action. Again, not in their nature. So this is demanding the Hawks do things they probably need to do to kind of you know, become a better playoff team. These are behaviors and, and habits that you need to, to be successful in the postseason. But it's just going to be interesting to watch and see how they tackle those things because it's just not been something they that's been a habit for them. When when you ask Quinn, you know, about what he's looking for out of the Hawks, you know, what he's trying to tweak since he got here, a lot of things, a lot of times the things that you hear is, you know, spacing, spacing and things like that. And that kind of goes hand in hand with, you know, when you ask the players the same thing, they'll say, you know, what we've really emphasized is those second actions. You know, once the primary action, you know, isn't getting everything that you wanted, you know, what happens next? And I, I think that's been a point of emphasis for them. Uh, if if what the players say is, is accurate, that sounds like, you know, the biggest change since, since Quinn took over. So it should be interesting. Uh, are there any players yeah. that you you feel like, you know, maybe have a outsized role in this particular matchup compared to maybe what they would have as a role in a normal game? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, so when, when I think about attacking a defense before it's set, I think about Jalen in that role. But I, I want to be careful and in, in, in not, like, suggesting, oh, it's an obvious thing that Jalen Jay, – Jalen should play a lot. The Heat are going to throw a lot at the Hawks young players. They they just do, right? And and where Jalen might give you a lot of push the you know rebound and push, you know, and, and attack. Say if he catches Hero as a young player, um, you know, Jalen is going to see a lot. I, I mean, I don't think AJ is going to play, um, but but there are some things that Jalen can do that could really help the Hawks if he can do well enough in those other areas where Miami's going to really try to challenge him. Similarly, I think Bay, you know, Bay is will, willing to mix it up physically. I think more so than the average Hawks player, 
willing to kind of if the if he gets chased off the three point line, he'll you know drive the ball down to the rim and try to use his phys, you know, his some physicality to kind of create some space there. I think that helps. I think Bay is kind of an X factor in this game in that if he can do well enough on defense as a team defender, that there are some things if he's making his three and or kind of driving the ball um, when he gets chased off the line could be huge. And if, if things are going well for him, I wouldn't be surprised to see him play thirty. Two minutes in this game, so you know something along those lines. So those are the two for me. Um, you know, uh, when it comes to like uh, when I think about a difference maker on defense, it's organization, it's communication because like Miami throws so much at you, and that's Flint and JC should be really really good in those areas. That, those are their areas of strength on defense. Akongu has, has improved a lot in that area as well, but that's again where it's going to come down to. It might be hard to play the young guys. You know, it might be Jalen might hold up on the first action, okay on the second action, and by the time you get third action, his head spinning. You know, because that's that's just how he kind of run things. Um, so so I have to see. I for me, I think Bay is a huge X factor in this game. I think the second X factor is Dejounte. When I rewatch the game, like Trey could get no space in the middle ever. Like they walled up three defenders all the time. Trey did great when they ran empty corner. You know, side or slash pick and roll open that up a lot. DJ got all the space in the middle he wanted, and so you know, I think they're gonna you know need twenty five points or so from him, and they're gonna need him to really attack that space there, like and and to do it with some urgency, not sit back and you know overly kind of rock his defender, you know, left to right, left to right, like he does, but really attack that space, and so. Uh, if 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 Miami are going to open the middle of the court for DJ, he's got to he's got to make shots. He's got to work hard for eight, nine, ten footers instead of settling for 16, 17 footers. You know, you know, maybe even trying to get to the rim and getting some contact. You know, getting a, a foul. You know, here and there. So that's the other kind of wrinkle is you know I, I think I, I put out that uh, this year Dejounte had twenty assists, six turnovers against the Heat. Trey had I think thirty nine assists and twenty one turnovers. And that trades a better ball handler than DeJounte, no doubt about that. But DeJounte really didn't face any anything that's remotely was the ball pressure with Heat through a tray. You know, the right. Heat will even run that soft 2 2 1, you know, press eating up the first seven, eight seconds of your shot clock, too. So, so DeJounte's got to bring it. You know, he has to. And, and he said so much all year long, like, that's why I'm here. You know, this is why I'm here. And this is the game. It, it kind of has to happen, you know for the Hawks to have a chance to put themselves in the best spot to win the game. Sort of along the same lines, how do the Hawks, I mean, obviously the Hawks go into this game and they know that they have to deal with what the Heat are going to do to Trey in terms of the attention that Trey gets. How do the Hawks survive the minutes when Trey's not out there? Because the flow of the game is going to be quite different and they're they're going to have different defensive focus when he's not out there. Yeah, that's you know, the, it'll be interesting to see if 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 when Trey is off, if Dejounte gets more ball pressure, more attention, or if the Heat are like, no, well, Dejounte, we're happy to let you kind of put it all on your shoulders. You know, the Heat are calculating like that. The Heat, heat may say to themselves, "Hey, if Dejounte's going to you know kind of eat the basketball for the possession, and they're not, and we can, you know, you know." entice them to not move the basketball on us, then you know, we'll let DeJounte, you know, get his pull-ups and at the free throw line or whatever, you know. So I think that the Heat will kind of unfortunately to a point, the Heat will kind of dictate what the Hawks do when Trey is off by do they are they interested in forcing the ball to DeJounte's hands or are they are they happy to kind of sit back and, and let him, you know, take his pull ups at the nail, you know. But we'll to but we'll have to kind of see. I that's where I I wish, you know, Jalen and the Congo had more reps in the short roll, you know, and, you know, and things like that. And, and maybe Quinn feels like he can kind of get some of that installed, you know, by Tuesday. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see um, how, how that goes. Um, yeah, I know DeAndre does quite well, you know, in the short roll at, at times. So maybe it's him, but man, the Heat know how to attack a weak ball handler, <laughs> you know, with digs, you know, at the nail and, you know, Jimmy just having an instinct of when to kind of jump in and get into, you know, 
uh, from a help defender kind of position, getting into a guy's space when he's vulnerable. So that feels a little bit iffy. So yeah, when, when Trey is off, it's, I think it's largely dictated by what the heat, what their, what their approach is. Uh, anything else you want to talk about relative to this series? All right, rebounding. I mean, it's the Heat work really, really hard on the boards. And if you let them, like they'll come in and and they'll uh, they'll eat on the offensive glass. So you know, it'll take five rebounders. You know, probably in most cases. Um, you know, Larry will mix it up. Um, the Heat are gonna muck the game up. And a lot of times that'll come on the offensive glass where they really kind of push, uh, you know, um, I don't know. I, I'll i view it sometimes as kind of a sportsmanship, you know, boundary. They're kind of pushing, you know, there and things like that. And <laughs> especially a, a Lowry, you know, and things like that. Oh. So, mm. you know, so the Hawks will have to maintain their composure and, they may, and hopefully do a little better than I do at times. So I get you know, kind of riled up seeing, seeing that stuff, but um that yeah the other area is just just the rebounding um yeah and then and then like the heater the heat play um struce a lot you know i mean we'll, he's one of the worst defenders in the league on ball you know i mean he's just atrocious you know on ball i and i went back and like looked at epm which i think is you know um the the kind of the go-to most people think are the stat now like uh, Hero this year negative zero point seven, Struess negative two point three, and to put negative two point three in contrast, Bogey this year negative two point zero. So Trey negative zero point five. So Trey and Hero are kind of in the same range, Struess statistically, uh, Struess and Bogey kind of in the same range. So, but for me, like Hero, when he gets caught in space, he's you know, so like I, I put up a play from the first six minutes of the last game where Hunter caught Hero and kind of quasi transition and just went right to the rim on him. And then I mean, Hero couldn't do anything. And there was a play where JC and Hunter caught Hero and Struess on the same side of the floor and just attacked them with two man action and got straight to the rim. And so I just feel like the Hawks, you know, are going to have to fight their tendency to kind of pull back, see, you know, Survey the floor, figure out they want to want to do what they want to do. Get into it. When they see a weak defender in space, I mean, they just need to empower everyone to like attack patients. JC can attack that. Hunter can attack that. Bay can attack that. Jalen can attack that. You know, and um, not to mention Dejounte. You know, and so I feel like everyone else being aggressive is what's going to be the thing that most likely takes the pressure off Trey to make him feel like, you know, by the time we get the third quarter of Trey's like, man, I got to do all this offense to work. Hawks are going to lose that game. You know, if Quinn is empowering everyone to, when they get in, no matter who it is, like even DeAndre, who will turn the ball over, you know, his fair share of times, but you catch Struce or Hero or Love, or even nowadays, like even Lowry, you catch those guys one-on-one in space before they're set, just go right at that. Even And if you turn a few times, who cares? We're attacking them before they get set, and we're rolling the dice, and we're, we know that that's going to serve us well. So physicality, attack early on defense, you got to stay connected. Quinn's got to keep up with Spo, <laughs> you know? Kind of hand in hand with that question because you're talking about you know some of the weaker defenders. Um, you know if the Heat get in a you know sort of one game winner take all sort of contest, like who do they put in their rotation? Like okay, so you know it's going to be Butler and Adebayo and Hero and Lowry and probably Struce. Uh, you know who else plays? Uh, obviously, you know Gabe Vincent, Caleb Martin. So okay, that gets us to seven, I guess. Right. Who else does Oladipo play? Did Cody Zeller, Kevin Love, like who who else is playing in this game? So I think Martin and Vincent are absolutely huge to what they want to do with Trey. For sure, those guys are going to. Those guys, right. I, 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 they absolutely play. Yeah, no and they're probably the, your primary guys on Trey. Right? Yep. Yep. And so, so that's there. I think um, Zeller's been good for them overall. Now, he really has no rim protection at this point in time, but they, the Heat try to hold up 
being physical at the point of attack and not letting the ball get to you know get to Zeller in the middle, right? Okay. And that's where attacking early, attacking weak defenders is huge. So I think Zeller's there. Um, Eight. Love, I mean, Love has been playing for them, and Love is so good at that two-man weak side action that back screen then pop out to the three point like love right. that, that action is built for kevin love for sure absolutely and so and so for me it's like <laughs> the hawks the hawks can decide like we're gonna we're gonna attack kevin love and force Spo to take him off the court or that cannot be a, a focus you know um same with kind of struce that if the hawks want to get struce off the floor like say say struce is hot he's making shots and you know he's great in that two-man backside action too you know setting that screen mm-hmm. popping up you know um, but you could in heroes, you know, in the playoffs at times, hero gets played off the court, you know, defensively, you know, and you give him a little credit. He's gotten a little bit, he's still pretty rough, but he's gotten a little better every year, you know, he's got a little bit more solid every year. But you know, it, to me, it's gonna come down to you know, whether the Hawks can fight their muscle memory of pulling back, serving, then figuring out what you want to do. And when you see a weak defender. I don't care who you are. If you have the ball, just go right at that dude and put Spo in a bad spot of like, oh, you know, Kevin Love is, you know, being put in a bad spot. Max Struess is getting put in a bad spot. Tyler here, you know, and, you know, attacking that. But again, I have to say, you know, I, I hope this is something Quinn can kind of get them ready to do because it's just not in their muscle memory at this point, you know. But, they, it's, but to me, it's something they have to try. All right. Well, I, uh, I, I think that covers it. <laughs> I appreciate you, you know, being ready. You were, you were it's ready. It's a big game. It's a big it game for this game. team, right? Oh, actually, actually, I have one more. Actually, I have one more. I forgot about this question. Like, uh, you know, it, it's a very hypothetical, theoretical question because you don't actually go for that. But, like, you know, the Hawks are – in this seven, eight game, they could be in, you know, some variation of an eight, nine or eight, 10 game on Friday. Uh, In a first round series, should they want to play Boston or should they want to play Milwaukee? Um, I mean, I think I picked Boston in that situation. Yeah. I think. I I don't know. uh, Yeah. It's hard. Um, It's it. Yeah. It, I, I think I pick Boston only because their three point variance can you know, swing in the opponent's favor sometimes, right? And you know, I mean, honestly, in the Boston series, you probably have to play Aaron Holiday. You got to have to have guys who can cover, who can rotate, close out, get there, you know, stay connected. And so, Milwaukee lets you play your young guys probably more, you know. And if like if your goal is to get your young guys seasoning. I think Milwaukee lets you play AJ if you want to. I think it lets you play Jalen and lets you max out the Congo minutes if that's what you want to do. Or I think it's harder to use those guys against Boston just because Boston spreads you out so much. If you're a quarter step late, kind of get moving on your rotation, they kill you. You know, where with Milwaukee, it's not so much that, you know. Um, Milwaukee's good at spreading you out too, but maybe Boston probably does it better than anybody except for when Golden State has everybody clicking, you know, still (laughs) these days. So, it's not, I don't want to sound like I'm enthusiastic about a matchup with Boston, but I just I think if you ask me like, do they have a little better chance of pushing Boston and Milwaukee? I think they do. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I I think you can get to the rim against Boston if you if you work hard, you can get to the rim against Boston against Milwaukee. <laughs> they got layers of defenders <laughs> keep getting to the rim, you know. Uh, so I, I, that's What's the big defensive one. three seconds. Who cares? Yeah, I know. So, yeah, but the thing for me, Kevin, is is this like now that we this is what like is this like the f- what, fourth season of playing? Oh boy, I'm not sure. it feels like it's about that. I started in the bubble, so that was nineteen. I don't know for sure. I can't remember for sure. Mm, the bubble was twenty. Twenty. Okay, so that 20, would be twenty one. Wait, wait, this would be four. Yeah, this would be four. Yeah. Okay, so this before, for me, like the the whole value of giving getting the seven eight is that you give yourself a, a chance to win, and you don't have to play from Tuesday to what Saturday, right? 
Um, yeah, that's huge. Whether you're seven, eight, nine, ten, if you have to play two games before you get in, you're. I mean, to me, I think we all focus on last year, like how bad the Hawks looked against Miami, and they looked bad, and it was bad. It was really bad, right? Right. But I, I feel like it, they were gassed. They were absolutely gassed before yeah. you ever got there. Yep. You know, and they, and both in both of those games, you know, they they had to fight to win that Cleveland game and the Charlotte game. You know, they had to. It wasn't like either yeah, one of them. You know, you know, so you know, Trey put up forty five against Charlotte two days before they had to play the first game against uh, Miami. And they got the early game on a Sunday against Miami for some reason. Like the NBA couldn't give them the, the last game on Sunday. You know, nope. it was an early start. And on it'll Sunday, probably so be it the like same a, this year. <laughs> probably be the same. So that's that. That's to me. That's why there's so much impetus on this first game. If you can win this game, I think you can start with the same amount of energy as your opponent, and then can maybe give yourself a chance to. And of course, the goal is if you can somehow still one of the first two on the opponent's court, you know, go home one one, then you just like, okay, we got something to work with. You know, that's really all you're thinking of as a seven eight seed is like, can we still one? You know, can we get one? And get you you have to play on Friday. Uh, sorry, you're not winning game one or game probably or game two. <laughs> yeah. It's just I mean, on, it's the, on the other team's home court. You know, it's so. such a terrible. I think they need to change it honestly because. You know, you're you're seeing today, like, was it today they announced that they're sort of investigating Dallas for the way that last game went down? And it's like the the incentive to get to 10 right now. I think, you know, four years in now, teams are, are, you know, realizing, hey, uh, 10, 10 is not really all it's cracked up to be like. What what's the point of being ten? Like, you got to win two games. And even if you do, you're you're pretty much instantly down 2 0. Uh, against the one seed, like that, that's not great. Like, I don't know. I think Especially, they have to figure out a way to maybe work one extra day of rest or something in there. So yeah, that yeah. Teams At aren't just saying play, ten. No, we don't want ten. Let's uh, let's just go find that lottery. And it, I mean, and I understand that, like the one and two seed, you want you kind of want them to play on Sunday because of the right, you know, some more prime time, more eyeballs than. Right. But maybe at least make it the last game on Sunday. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, come on. Like, right. Hawks Heat played the first game yeah. on, on that Sunday, which was just crazy, you know. Uh, but, but I agree. I don't think they should have to play until Monday. You know, if you if you play on Friday, I don't think you should have to play until Monday. It's just, it's just, I mean, not that anyone's going to care about anyone standing up for a 9 or 10 seed or 8 seed. <laughs> well, I you think know, you or just whatever. protect the integrity of the process. Like, you can't. Yeah. You know, if you want to point a finger at Dallas and say, "Hey, you did this the wrong way," like you, that's you've got to give that, them some incentive to to want to be there. Yeah, yeah. And then this year, you look at what Dallas did, and I mean, if you're like, okay, we could get ten, maybe, or we can get some ping pong balls that could get us first. Yeah, you know, and there's a pretty attractive uh, guy in this draft class <laughs> that you know. I mean, New Orleans jumped. For, didn't they go from what were they thirteen or fourteenth, and we got all the way to to one, you know, to get to get Zion, you know. So I mean, it, I think they left almost the whole field, you know, that year. And uh, I remember the stories about Alvin Gentry running around the room saying, uh, "F yeah," you know, over and over and over and over <laughs> and over, you know. So, so I mean, you know. I you know I everyone has their little slogan for like tanking for whoever or do you know and for me it's like embracing the seller for the French feller is what I've been saying all year long you know um, with Vic um, so I've, nine and ten is not an enticing spot to be in I mean and the only the only kind of outlier I could see is like if it's a team that has a superstar that missed almost the whole year he's finally back he's been yep. playing for two or three weeks you know. And that, that they're actually more like a six or five seed. That that's different. There's yep. not one of those this year, you know, to me. So, um, but so I mean, for me, I, you know, I, I also put down on Twitter since February one, offensive rating Hawks four, Heat twenty, defensive rating Hawks twenty one, Heat twenty. The Heat are not some special team, right? Right. Their habits are special. Their ability to scheme and adjust on the fly and out execute you and be physical is 
is pretty unique. If you can deal with all that, they're a very beatable team. You know, the Hawks have a better record than them since February 1st. Uh, they've been below the league average on offense and defense since February 1st. They haven't added anyone since February 1st. I don't, I think Lowry makes them worse in large overall when he's on the court. I don't know that love helps them in those. Trey, I think, like, yeah, I I think somebody like Gabe Vincent, like you said, Gabe Vincent and Caleb Martin are more useful in the series against. Yeah, give me 38 minutes to Gabe Vincent if I'm (laughs) slow. You know, give me that. So, you know, so, so the Hawks can win this game. I think it's a mental exercise of dealing with physicality, trying to match it. Dealing with the execution, second, third, fourth action. Can you? Want to fall back to survey the floor, find a mismatch, go at it in isolation. That's just that's just not going to work. So Quinn's got to help them overcome their habits. They're, they're pretty long held habits. And if they do that, this is a winnable game. And if they win this game, then I'm going to be excited to see them come off some rest, you know, facing, uh, I guess it would be Boston. That would be know, Boston, yeah. In that scenario, right? Um, yeah. So, yep. um, yeah. So, I'm excited for Tuesday to get here. Uh, let's, let's, let's have fun watching that game and hope it's just hope it's good basketball game to watch. All right. To the I I really don't like that they don't count these as postseason games because it's just bad just bad for language. I keep wanting to say you know to the postseason we oh these are not postseason games these are playing games that just sit in purgatory and don't count as anything official. I that's rough. I, I my, my, what language I'm supposed to use because it's not the regular season but it's not the postseason. It's just to the play and we go. <laughs> the play and we go and then and next year like does the in-season tournament when that gets here does that count as regular season it's gonna be well, weird because i think they're gonna have purgatory like, too we'll see i think they're gonna have like an international teams who are not nba teams in the, in the uh, so it's we're gonna need some help with how we talk about this i don't I'm thankful that we don't have to figure that out tonight but we're probably gonna need to do some work or get some help on how do we how do we contextualize all that right yep all right I will talk to you again soon, and I appreciate you taking the time, sir. Thanks, Kevin. Have a good night. You too.